Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lee, and I'm a professor of physics at the, at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams. This public talk is part of an initiative at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The primary goal of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Catherine Fries on dark matter in the universe. Professor Fries is the Jeff and Gail Kudolski Endowed Professor and uh, Endowed Chair and Professor of Physics at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research spans a wide range of topics in cosmology and astroparticle physics. She has been working to identify the dark matter and dark energy that per per permeates the universe, as well as to build a successful model for the early universe immediately after the Big Bang. The author of the popular book, The Cosmic Cocktail, Three Parts Dark Matter, she has been very active in public outreach, including television, radio, public lectures, podcasts, and public panels. Her many TV appearances include Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman and the Discovery's channels How the Universe Works. She has given public lectures at TEDx Vienna, the Hayden Planetarium in New York, hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. Professor Fries received her Bachelor of Arts in Physics from Princeton University, her Master of Arts in Physics from Columbia University, and her PhD in Physics from the University of Chicago. Following several postdoctoral positions, she served on the faculty at MIT at the University of Michigan and was director of the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics in Stockholm and is now a guest professor at Stockholm University. Her honors include an honorary doctorate from the University of Stockholm, the American Physical Society Lilienfeld Prize, and election to the National Academy of Sciences. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the chat or question and answer dialogue box. Now, at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Catherine Fries. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for that lovely introduction. So I'm talking about a subject that really got started about 100 years ago in the sense of modern cosmology. So if we look back before that, throughout history dating back to antiquity, I'm sure that people asked the same questions we do now. They wanted to know what is out there? What, how did it all begin? What's, what's going on? And the remarkable thing is that when they had, cre whereas they had creation myths, we actually have a model for cosmology that is basically correct. The hot big bang model, it's incomplete, but it's basically right. So that's kind of an amazing achievement for humanity over the past century. And it all started with Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1915. So soon after he wrote down his equations, others took the theory and applied it to the universe as a whole. And they based, wrote down the basic equations that describe the evolution of the universe the way that we, the same equations we use today. But then there are several solutions to the equations, namely the universe could have been expanding or contracting or static. And Einstein had a, had a favorite. He liked the idea of a static universe, which would be the same at all points in time. But unfortunately, the, the um, perfect theory doesn't always match reality. And in this case, it was the work of Edwin Hubble in 1929, who showed that the universe is expanding. So he used the telescopes, the Mount, Mount Wilson Observatory above Pasadena in California, and he made really, really seminal discoveries. For one thing, he was the first to prove that there's anything out there beyond our own galaxy. Before that, people had thought that all the stars are inside our Milky Way. Well, but they're not. The universe is much, much larger than that. And then he also observed light from galaxies at various distances away from Earth. And he observed, hmm, we know what the light should look like when it was emitted by those atoms in those galaxies. So we know the wavelength of that light. So um, in this picture, here's a wave. And so we know when the light was emitted, what, what it should look like. 
But by the time it got to us, those waves were stretched. The wavelength was longer. And so this is sort of like if you blow up a balloon, if you had a, drew a picture on there of a, of a wave, then it would grow, so the, wave, the waves would look stretched simply because the universe is expanding or so the balloon would be expanding, but the same analogy holds for us. The universe is expanding. So I don't mean to imply we live on the surface of, of anything like a balloon. And sorry, my slides are jumping and I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, he, he discovered the expanding universe at which point Einstein had to abandon the static universe. So this is just a mock-up of the fact that galaxies as a whole are all expanding away from each other. And I mean, obviously you and I are not expanding away from each other because our local gravity is very strong and the Milky Way is not falling apart because its local gravity is very strong. Um, but on the average, if you look on large enough scales, galaxies are all moving apart from one another. The cosmologist's view of the Big Bang is that it started 14 billion years ago in a hot primordial soup of elementary particles. Um, I have to do something different to make these slides stop jumping. Let me see if I can do anything about that. Okay. So they, all these particles initially were, they were very, very tightly packed together. The universe was very, very dense. And these particles all interacted with each other constantly because the universe was so hot. But then as time goes on, the universe expands and cools off. So these particles move apart from one another, these fundamental particles, and they don't bump into each other quite as often anymore. So the idea of the, of the Big Bang is a universe is cooling and expanding from a hot primordial dense state. So here's an analogy that's kind of nice. It's the raisin bread an analogy for the universe. So the idea here is that these raisins are kind of like the galaxies inside the universe. So if you took some dough for raisin bread and you put it in the oven, then that, and you heat it up, then the, the, the dough would expand and the raisins move apart from one another, not because they're doing anything, just, but just because the, the bread itself is expanding. So that's kind of a nice analogy for the universe. But there's a one major difference between the bread and us, which is that the bread has a central, central point. Somewhere in the middle, there is the center of the raisin bread. Whereas in our universe, it's very possible that the universe is infinite. So no matter where you are, it always would look the same. So um, in fact, if we go backwards in time, let's do the opposite now. Let's take this infinite universe and shrink everything closer and closer together. What happens? Well, everything in the room that you're sitting in would converge to a point as you go backwards in time. But on the largest, large enough scales, hmm, if you take an infinite universe and you scrunch it tighter and tighter together, well, it's still infinite. So it does not contract to a point. And, but what does happen is that it gets so dense that we don't know how to describe that physics anymore. Our laws of physics fail and you'd have to have a theory of quantum mechanics and gravity together, a theory of quantum gravity, like string theory or something to go farther back in time. So really the Big Bang is, is the point in time where we don't know how to go any farther back. So one way to think about it, I mean, it's not an explosion, but what the heck, let's just draw one anyway. But so if you, it's really not a point in space, it's a point in time where everything um, was expanding from there on out and we know how to describe it from there on out. So where do we stand in cosmology today? Well, not only have there been huge advances over the past century, but even over the, at, at the turn of the millennium, the major discoveries happened. So we answered some really important questions. What's the geometry of the universe, the total mass energy content, the age of the universe. We know a lot more about the universe uh, since the turn of the millennium. But of course, other big questions remain such as what is the universe made of that I wanted to talk about today. But on this, let's talk about the geometry that we do have the answer to at this point. And the idea here is that in the, these, in the 1930s, it was, there were three possible geometries, three possible evolutions for the universe. So it could, be, could have been a closed geometry. And of course, these pictures are a lower dimensional analogs for the universe as a whole, because I can't draw the whole universe, but it could, be, that could have been that we live on the surface of a sphere or that the entire universe is on the surface of a higher dimensional saddle or that it is sort of this normal flat geometry. And again, you're supposed to think higher dimensional, so it'd be more like a cube. And the geometry is different. So ordinarily a triangle like this, the angles add to 180 degrees. But if we were living on the surface of a sphere, they would add up to more. 
or on the surface of a saddle, they would add up to less. And I have some more pictures of the differences in the geometry that are kind of fun. So here's this little snail sending off two light beams that appear to be parallel. And in the, in the flat geometry, which just means there's no curvature, then they, they indeed the parallel lines would never meet. But in an open geometry like the saddle, they would diverge. Or in the closed geometry, they'd go around the surface of the sphere. And if unimpeded, they would come back and bite this creature from behind. So they would converge eventually. Now, how did we figure out the which of these geometries is correct? Well, the answer to that comes from the cosmic microwave background light, which was leftover light from the, from the Big Bang. And it was produced uh, when the universe was about 400,000 years old. Um, I forgot to mention the current age of the universe is 14 billion years old. So that was really a drop in the bucket, very, very early light. And if we look at the properties of this light, which has been measured over, all over the sky really, really carefully, then the temperature is um, roughly the same the, the, of, of this light, but there are slight deviations. And so the orange spots are a little bit hotter than average. The blue spots are a little bit colder than average. And these differences tell us the geometry of the universe. So it's really the size of these hot spots and, and cold spots that's so critical. And the reason is that if light from these hot spots moved in a straight line, then we would expect that the size of these hot spots should be about one angular degree in scale, one angular degree across. Whereas if the hot spots were bigger or smaller, then that would correspond to a different geometry. So light moving in a straight line means a flat geometry and whoop, look at that. There indeed is a lot of power at one degree angular scale. Those hot spots are that, that exactly the size, that, the way they look to us that they should be if light moved in straight lines. So the geometry of the universe is flat indeed. And I want to mention from these other peaks here in this data, we learn incredible amounts about the other parameters in cosmology. But just to be really clear, flat geometry doesn't mean we live in a two dimensional world. It just means that there's no curvature. And so for example, take a cube and move it out to all the sides out to infinity. So it's just normal geometry. So um, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, no curvature, no weird geometry. So that's what that, that terminology means. So now that once, once you know the geometry of the universe, then you look back at Einstein's equations of general relativity. I promise I won't be putting a lot of equations in this talk, but this is, this is such a big deal from 1915. On the left-hand side, you have the curvature of space. And on the right-hand side, you have all the content of the universe, the mass, the energy, everything on the right-hand side. So what this equation does is really, it relates the geometry on this side to the mass and energy content on the other side of the equation. And you've all seen pictures like this. Well, I, I don't know if you have, but anyway, so if for here, here's the earth and it warps the space around it. And so this is this connection between the content of the universe and the space time, the geometry of the space time. These two things are intimately connected by Einstein's equation. So what that means is that by knowing the geometry of the universe being flat, no curvature, that tells us the energy density of the universe. So this is how much stuff is in the universe on the average, 10 to the minus 29 gram per cubic centimeter. And, and since you probably don't have a sense of what that means, let me compare it to Earth. So water on Earth is one gram per cubic centimeter. So this is really diffuse when you go out into outer space, far away from everything, that's what you would get. And I do have a funny story how I tried to explain this to the Queen of Sweden and ran into a snafu it was pretty funny. So if we have time later, I'll tell you that story. Okay, so we know what the total is, but we don't know. Oh, before I move on, I have to tell this joke. So this is the same data, different color scheme, the same stuff, different satellite. And you see here the initials of Stephen Hawking. Just kidding. Well, so we, so we know the total content of the universe, but we still don't know what it's made of. At least we only know a small part of it. Everything that we're familiar with in our daily lives, so that would be our bodies, the chairs we sit in, the walls around our rooms, sure, have a cocktail, the earth, the sun, everything that we're familiar with, the air we're breathing, everything, all adds up to, well, it's made of atoms, we know that, but all of that atomic stuff only adds up to 5% of the universe. 
and we don't know what the other 95% is. So that's a pretty uncomfortable situation. So what is a, was a surprising fact that what that which we know is 5% of the universe and then 25% roughly is dark matter and 70% roughly is dark energy. So obviously we were, so this is the goal of, of my research is try to figure out what these other things are. And I'm gonna to focus today in particular on the dark matter because we know so much more about its general properties that we really have a, a good chance of figuring out what it's made of. Katie, there's a, there's a question in the question answer. Uh, the question is how can light be affected by gravity in neutron stars and black holes if it has no mass? May I make a suggestion? Can we hold the questions to the end? Sure, sure, let's do that. I think that works better because otherwise the, you know, the, the, the stream gets kind of derailed for the talk. Sure, let's do that. Great. Well, but the timing was, was good because now we're switching to specifically, I want to tell you how we know that dark matter exists. So, um, and this is a problem that believe it or not is 90 years old. So I'd say it's the longest outstanding problem in all of modern physics. It dates back to the 1930s to Knut Lundmark in Sweden and Fritz Zwicky, who was a Swiss scientist working again in Pasadena in the same observatory as, as Hubble. And so famous, I'll tell you a little bit about what Zwicky did. So he was looking at a cluster of galaxies. So this is hundreds of galaxies packed together into a single object, the, the coma cluster. And he noticed that the galaxies on the outskirts were moving really, really fast. And well, the, they should be responding to the tug and pull of the other galaxies that are farther in, but the math didn't work out. So in order to explain these rapid motions of the farther out galaxies, you have to add in extra matter. So something that you don't see is also pulling on those outer galaxies. And so this is that the, the idea was it would be dunkle materie, which is the German for dark matter. And what does the name mean? Well, not much. It just means it's not stars. It doesn't shine. It's dark. And this guy uh, was apparently quite a character. So in his book, he called his, co his colleagues spherical bastards, because no matter what direction you look at them from, they're still bastards. Oh, boy. So uh, let's go on and historically now there was a lot of discussion pro and con this this idea of dark matter and it was really nailed as as really there really is something there by Vera Rubin and Kent Ford in the 1970s so um, they looked they basically proved that every galaxy has dark matter in it so let me show you how they did that she died a few years ago um, but this was just this incredibly important research and let me go, so I'm going to leave the dark matter, go away from the dark matter problem for a second to, get, to just give you a very useful analogy, and that's the solar system. So what, I'm, what I'm, I'm showing here, it's called a rotation curve, is a plot. All right, so let's start out here. This is the sun, and I'm going to move away from the sun. And these are the radii of orbits, okay? So you've got something whizzing around the sun, and, and then you move away from it. And here's how fast these objects are moving. So let's start out. Okay, so the planet closest to the sun is Mercury, and it's moving the fastest. Okay, so then we move out a little bit, and we get to the next one out, Venus. Then we get to Earth, Mars, da, da, da. And you'll notice that as you move farther out, the planets move more and more slowly. And you'll also notice, if you count, that instead of removing Pluto like I was supposed to, I accidentally added a tenth planet, and I just thought it was funny, so there you go. So... Yeah, I do have an equation here, but it's um, it's a lot less complicated than the equation of general relativity. But what it's showing you, it's this equation co corresponds to this curve, and what it tells you that yeah, as you move further out, as our as this as you move further out, the speeds should go down. But they also depend on the mass of the sun. So if the mass of the sun were four times as big, all Hello. these. Hello. Hi, Margo. How are you? Wait, you know, wait a second. <laughs> Yes, or heard. Hang on, mute. Okay, okay, I have to go. Katie's giving a lecture. Yes, I know, but she's giving a public lecture in the kitchen, so I, I can't talk now. I'll talk to you later. Okay, ta-ta. And can you mute her? Yeah, I think it's done. Okay, sorry, that's my guest in the other room, and she wanted to listen to the lecture, but this... Okay. 
<laughs> okay, so anyway, so um, what was I saying? Okay, so I was saying that if, if the mass of the sun were four times as big, then everything would be moving twice as fast. So this what this basically tells you is this backing up here, this planets, Mercury, Venus, da 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 da, da the more mass you have interior to their orbits, the faster they would move. So that's the, the idea of these rotation curves. Um, and I also, just for fun, wanted to show you Tycho Brahe, who made the measurements of these planetary orbits. So he lost his nose in a duel and wore a gold and silver replacement ever since. And it's also, there was a, I'd always heard the story that he died at a dinner with the king because he had a lot of wine and you're not supposed to get up until the king does. And so his bladder burst and he died a few days later. But this was interesting about 10 years ago, they decided to see if it, if it, had, it instead had been mercury poisoning. So they dug up his body in Denmark and did a bunch of studies on his mustache hairs, which were still there because they thought maybe his student Johannes Kepler poisoned him and Kepler's law should really have been Brahe's loss. Anyhow, there was no sign of mercury poisoning. So I guess the first bladder story is correct. And again, I have a funny story about myself. I got to go to the Nobel lecture, um, sorry, the Nobel prize ceremony and, and there was a dinner and again, yes, hmm, I, well, I did get up even before the king and I was chastised. So this, I really do believe this story. <laughs> anyway, so back to dark matter. So the same thing that we did with the solar system um, we're going to do the same idea with galaxies. So we'll do the, in, instead of rotation of curves of, of planets, we'll do galaxies. Okay, so starting at the center of a galaxy, and then as you move farther and farther out, you watch things move around the center. And the point is that the speed of these orbits depends on how much mass you have interior to that radius. So things that are, if they're far out and they're whizzing around, that means, oh my gosh, there's more mass than we can explain in terms of the light that we see. And then that tells you, you need dark matter. So here's the same picture I showed for planets, but this time for the, for the motions of objects in the galaxy. And based on the stellar light, this is what you should have seen. This is kind of like what you see in the solar system. But the measurements that uh, Vera Rubin made are this is a um, flat rotation curve instead. So these, 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 uh, this curve just continues on flat for a long time. And so if you, you have to add in more mass to, make, to make, have it make sense. And that's what's done here. And we call this the halo of the galaxy. And so I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. But let me use the Milky Way as an example. So at the center of the uh, Milky Way, there's a giant supermassive black hole that weighs about 4 million times as much as the sun, that's shown in yellow. And I just wanted to jump ahead for a second because this was the origin of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics, the discovery of this thing uh, by Andrea Getz and Reinhard Genzel. And it weighs, as I said, about 4 million times as much as the sun. Then as you move out from away from the center, there are these spiral arms of structure. That's where most of the stars are sitting in the galaxy, including our sun. So it looks like a pinwheel. Now let's take this whole pinwheel and look at it from the side. And then um, there's the thing, we call it the disc of the galaxy, this pinwheel structure seen from the side. And indeed from the center that we go out 25,000 light years and there's the sun. So um, then the question is, what about the galaxy as a whole? And, oh, I, I do want to point out supermassive black holes are not the dark matter. Every galaxy has one at the center, but they make up a tiny, tiny fraction of the universe as a whole. So this, black, the, this supermassive black holes and dark matter are two different things. But back on this question of, of what the galaxy looks like. So here you go, I have it behind me, okay? So there, look, you see behind me, there we go. We have the spiral structure of the Milky Way. And then you have this other large thing around it that is spherical structure that's made almost entirely of dark matter. So um, this is of course an artist's rendition and this, but we know this is there, we can, we can see how it pulls on things, it's there. And what the heck is it made of? Now, that was the initial evidence that dark matter exists, but there's many other, as many others as well, which is, and here's Einstein's lensing. This is um, something he proposed and it was discovered almost immediately afterwards to be true. And this is relevant to that question that somebody was asking, which is that mass bends light. So let's put some mass here, it doesn't matter what it is. I put a massive compact whole halo object. 
So whatever this dark matter is, it doesn't give off light, but it bends the light behind it. So here we have a star and um, general relativity tells us that the light gets bent from that star on its way to our telescope. So hmm, we would notice, first of all, that, well, since it can bend in more than, more than one direction, you would get multiple images of the star and they would be sheared. Um, and so you get multiple sheared images. And then based on studying this background light, you'd be able to figure out how much dark matter there is on route. So that's a way to, to test for the, dark, the existence of dark matter and to find out where it is. So it is kind of fun. There's an app you can on your phone written by a Michigan graduate student. And it has the correct equations of gravitational lensing. So it's really fun because you can lens yourself. So here are some students who lens themselves more and more and more. So this is, a, this is an example over here of strong lensing. Well, let's turn to some actual data now from Hubble Space Telescope. So here we go. And um, so you can see that there are some distant galaxies that got lensed. They're, they're, you have multiple images, they're sheared. There's an awful lot of activity going on here. I don't know all the details, but I can tell you from these background lensed galaxies, we can figure out how much dark matter was in between them and us. So when you do the computer reconstruction of that, then you get images like the next one. The next image is also using Hubble Space Telescope and doing the computer reconstruction, but I wanted to warn you, these two images are not the same objects. Okay, so, but for this other object, when you do it, I think it's just such a beautiful picture. So this tells you, okay, how much mass there is at different points in the sky. And you see, well, there's a lot of mass in here and that's, that's those are the galaxies inside a cluster. So we have a cluster. I think it's the same one actually that um, Zuki was looking at. It has tons and tons of galaxies, but look in between there's more mass from this reconstruction of the light bending. And so there's mm, a lot of dark matter in clusters even outside of galaxies. So we have rotation curves, we have lensing, we also have the bullet cluster. What a strange object, and it really gives us so much information. It shows us that, well, if there, there are two clusters of galaxies that collided with one another, okay? So one collision happens between two clusters and the ordinary matter got stuck. It's shown in pink. It gives off x-rays, it's how we know it's there, it's gas. And so you and I, if we were to collide, wouldn't get very far, we have, electromagnetic interactions, the same ones that cause light, but we also have strong interactions. That's what holds your nuclei together. And so we would collide and get stuck, which is what happened to the gas. Hmm. But from lensing, we can see there's more stuff in blue. And so that is a different kind of mass. It did something different. So the dark matter is relatively collision less that these particles just kept going. They had no strong or electromagnetic interactions and they just kept going. And yep, there you go. Two types of matter that behave differently. <laughs> Very informative. Um, I, so there's another interesting fact, which is that without dark matter, our, we could not exist because our galaxies could not exist. Ordinary matter takes too long to clump. It's, Ordinary matter is tied to the, to the light, the cosmic microwave background light. And so, so the light would pull out and destroy any structure you tried to form. But dark matter does not talk to light, as we've said. And so it can do its own thing and it can form galaxies on its own. And so that's what it does. <laughs> so let's start out early, very early in the universe. And it's from inflationary cosmology, from a very early epoch of the universe that you get well, these are the blue pictures, the blue dots in here are actually the dark matter. And they're not entirely, they're not completely uniformly distributed. There's some little regions that have more dark matter than others. And that comes from inflation, the origin of these little lumps of dark matter. But these tiny, tiny bits of dark matter then pull in more and more mass and more, et cetera, et cetera. And then they're going to end up making the large scale structure, in other words, the galaxies and clusters of our universe. So this, I have a few slides from a simulation that show the dark matter clumping together. So as we move forward in time, you see these dark matter clumps. And this is the end of the simulation corresponding to today. And it really matches our universe pretty well. So are, there are these long filaments of structure and the galaxies would be at the nodes or intersections of these filaments. So again, without the dark matter, this structure wouldn't have formed and we would not have, gal the galaxies that are our, our home would not exist. So I've told you some of the evidence for dark matter and you know what, there's a whole lot more. And so I haven't even talked about the dark matter that's 
that we learn about from these other peaks in this cosmic microwave background light. I have talked about the lensing and about the rotation curves, and there's also the additional evidence for Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, however, that still doesn't tell us. So we know it's there, it's pulling on things, and, and we see it behaving differently from the ordinary matter. But the question is, what about, what kind of interactions does it have other than gravitational? And so that leads me to this, back to this picture of trying to figure out, well, what is it? So the initial guess could be simple things like, could it be rocks or gas or dust? And it turns out that any one of those has, there would be signatures of those observational consequences that just aren't seen. So the answer is no, it's nothing ordinary. Um, and so what is it? Well, I can show you a whole page, a whole slide of candidates because we don't know the answer. And I'm gonna argue these two wimps and axions by, are by far the best motivated and I'm gonna spend most of my time back on that. But for now, let me just comment. First of all, neutrinos, they are known to exist. And so 50 years ago, people thought maybe, oh, that's good. We have particles that exist. Maybe they are, they are the dark matter, but that cannot be. So they're, they're very light and they ruin galaxy formation. Um, and not only that, but we now know what their masses are. There's been measurements, um, at least of mass differences. And so we know neutrinos only comprise one half a percent of the total content of the universe. So neutrinos don't do it. But in addition to the ordinary neutrinos that we know and love from accelerator physics, we know how to study them. We know them really well. It's, people postulate additional neutrinos that don't interact in a normal way with our, you know, the normal standard model of particle physics. But there, so there could be an additional neutrinos that are um, unusual, or there could be primordial black holes. And that primordial black hole idea has seen a lot of interest lately because of some data that I want to tell you about. So what do I mean by primordial? Well, they would have been born in the universe in the first fractions of the age of the universe when there would be some region of the universe that would be have very, very, would have extra density, would be more a little bit more packed in than everything else and enough packed in to collapse in itself and make black holes. So that could have happened at a number of different epochs when there's some kind of transition going on in the early universe. And then, as I said, the reason that people are interested in is they could explain the black holes um, responsible for the gravitational waves seen in the LIGO detector. So what LIGO sees, um, oh, let me go to this slide, okay? So you have two black holes and the process of merging together, they give off gravitational waves, which also had been predicted by Einstein. And when you wave your hand, there are gravitational waves, but nobody's ever gonna detect those. But if two black holes merge, they're, they're detectable, but barely. And so the way it works is that you have a detector that I can show better here. So there are these four kilometer long arms. And when a gravitational wave goes by, then one of the arms gets smaller and the other one gets bigger by a tiny, tiny, tiny difference, a fraction of the size of the proton, the length of these arms changes and they manage to measure it. It's phenomenal. So anyway, the objects, the first ones they found were 30 times the mass of the sun, the black holes they found. And people said, well, that's interesting. Those could be primordial black holes. And if that's true, then dark matter could be made of them. So that's a lot of revival of interest on the subject of primordial black holes as dark matter. But I wanna turn back now again, I said the best, well, there's a bunch of other candidates as you see, but the two best motivated are the WIMPs and the axions. And so I'm gonna tell you um, about those. And so, the reason they're the most best motivated is because they are not invented just to solve the dark matter problem. Yes, they're still theoretical. They're not, they haven't been observed, but the, uh, the, 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 the argument is, well, in particle physics, there are other unsolved problems that people are trying to figure out how to handle. And in the process of solving those problems, at least on paper, you automatically get these dark matter candidates. So you're killing two birds with one stone, at least theoretically speaking. And so let me start by mentioning about the axions. So these are very, very light particles. And so uh, um, this is, um, I don't know, I don't know how, way, way lighter than protons. They don't weigh much. And they arose in a, so in here, a trillionth as much as a proton. Okay. And so, and yet they're slow moving. And they were invented by independently by Wein, Steve Weinberg and Frank Wilczek. And the th I mentioned the, the strong force, which is what holds your nuclei together. Well, there's a problem in the theory of the strong interactions. And if you solve that problem, you automatically get axions, as these two guys noticed. 
And so they're really, so the theoretical motivation is really high for these things. But before I move on, I have to say something about Steven Weinberg, who, who he, he just passed away in July. And he was, um, yeah, he's gonna go down in history. In my time, he was the greatest living physicist. He was he really one of the founders of the standard model of particle physics. And he was one of the great thinkers about all kinds of things. I, I was very fortunate he was down the hall from me in, in terms of his office and just absolutely foundational work, wonderful human being, what a loss. Um, and at Texas, we're gonna we're, we're working to create a Weinberg Institute in his honor. So y'all come on down. <laughs> okay, so on the side of looking for axions, those original axions um, were interest, were, have, are very highly motivated, but then people realize, well, there are axion-like particles in string theory and da 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 da. So the, 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 the kinds of things people are looking for have expanded. And there's a review by my former postdoctoral fellow, Luca Vizzinelli, that's very nice on the searches for these things. So, well, here, are the, this is the mass of these things. We're not sure exactly how much they weigh. And this is how they interact with, with photons. And so we don't know exactly how that works. And that's, um, so anyway, so the theory is in these yellow lines and the green here is the experiment that's about to really test the theory. So that's, I just wanted to mention that. But I wanna really focus for the rest of the talk on the uh, dark matter candidates called WIMPs. This is what I've really primarily worked on. And, Vera, the best motivated particles, and these are this we, this name stands for weakly interacting massive particles. So uh, a reporter once asked me, so we ended up writing a paper on it. It turns out that billions pass through your body every second, but only about one, somewhere between one a day and one a month hits hits one of your nuclei, and as you noticed, you survived the experience. They're harmless. Um, yeah, we call them weakly interacting because they don't have strong or electromagnetic forces. They feel gravity, but there are, we know of four fundamental forces and the remaining one after the, after it's not these two is it could be, these particles could have weak interactions. This is a, the fourth fundamental force, the weak force, which is responsible for some types of radioactivity. So uh, that's what is meant by the WI in the name weakly interacting. And what's meant by massive is that they weigh about one to 10,000 times as much as protons. So, why do we think they're such great candidates? Well, the first reason that the numbers come out right for how many there should be around that you get this 25% dark matter. All right, so how do we do this calculation? Well, let's go back to the early universe when all these particles, as I mentioned, are interacting with each other. It's hot, it's, it's this smashing of particles together. And well, as the universe cools off, uh, these interactions slow down and then they stop. And for the case of the WIMPs, they are their own antimatter. So they're annihilating with each other, producing something else early on. But then once you get the universe to be spread out enough because it cooled off and expanded, then those interactions stop. And you can ask, well, how many are left today? And the only ingredient in doing this calculation is the annihilation rate is determined by the weak interaction. So that's how much they annihilate is given by the weak interaction. And when you do that calculation, uh, forget about this equation. I'm just going to tell you the result. The, the, the number of WIMPs today turns out to be the right answer for the dark matter uh, requirements for the universe. And then, as I mentioned, the mass is, uh, they weigh between one and 10,000 times as much as protons. So that's the first reason that people are so excited about them as candidates. And the second one is that uh, particle theories exist for other reasons and they automatically contain WIMPs. And so an important example of this is supersymmetry, which is an, it's, uh, it, it, where every particle we know has a partner. So here are the standard particles in, in particle physics, the quarks, leptons, Higgs, and so on. And if supersymmetry is right, then every one of those would have a partner. And here are the supersymmetric particles with, with these twiddles over the top to symbolize that they're supersymmetric. So these guys are heavier than the known particles, which is why we haven't discovered them. And the heaviest, they would de decay, the lighter, the heaviest one to the next heaviest and blah, blah, blah. Until you got to the very lightest one, which cannot decay and it sticks around for the age of the universe. And so the lightest supersymmetric particle could be the dark matter. And yes, it would be a wimp. So um, that's, the that's a nice theory. Now, how do we go out and look for these things? Well, there's a three-pronged approach. 
So you can either, how do you make, how do you make a wimp? Well, you, what, what, how can you test for wimps? Well, you can make it, you can shake it, or you can break it. So it's the same diagram looked at in different directions where I have a, a, this is the weak force. And on this side, I have two dark matter particles, the X's. And on this side, I have two ordinary matter particles and they can interact, interact in a bunch of different ways I'll talk about. And the fourth prong for, detect, prong for detection would be dark stars that we invented. So I hope I have a chance to tell you briefly about that. But let's turn to this first way to search for WIMPs, which is make them. So in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, this is in Geneva in Switzerland, and yeah, people go skiing for the afternoon. So this is a, a ring that crosses the French and Swiss border four times, actually, and it's 17 miles around. So the way it works is that protons are accelerated to nearly the speed of light and they go in opposing directions around the ring and then they, then they um, collide at in different intersection points where there are detectors. And one of the detectors is called the Atlas detector. And this is Fabiola Gianotti. She was the spokesperson for the Higgs discovery and she's now director general of the entire laboratory at CERN. This is the, the, a picture of the Atlas detector. This is unbelievable, the technology that go, went into this. The human being here is very small by comparison. And another detector is the CMS detector. And this is Peter Higgs, the, who, uh, who the, the, the Higgs boson was named after him. And so the first success of this accelerator was discovery of the Higgs boson. And here it is, it's this bump and it weighs 100, uh, 125 times as much as protons. Protons weigh one GeV, the Higgs is 125 GeV. So there it is, this bump, this discovery. But the second major goal of this accelerator in, in Switzerland would be the search for supersymmetry, the search for dark matter. And let's see what would happen. Well, you could have these two protons colliding from this ring after being accelerated around the ring. And then they could give, they could produce supersymmetric particles, which heavier ones would decay to lighter ones, da 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 da, da until you got to the lightest one, which would escape detection. And so you'd have some missing energy as a signature that something left the detector. Um, and then the other thing you'd look for are these chains that come off when these when these decay when these things happen. So there's two things to look for, but as yet, no discovery of supersymmetry. And so I guess so it looks like particle masses are being pushed up. And so we'll wait and see what comes out of this search for making the dark matter. But in the meantime, there's another way to look for them, which is uh, to, to you, these underground detection experiments. And so the base is called direct detection. The basic idea is you have, this is your detector. It's made of some kind of nucleus. Along comes the WIMP because we have all of these things flying around in the galaxy. The galaxy is made almost entirely of wimps, right? So you have a wimp coming along, hitting the nucleus and scattering off of it. And then that heats up the nucleus. And so there's, you look for that little bit of heating up. It's very, it's very slight and the count rate is very low, one count per kilogram per day. So it's a very, very difficult experiment. And this, now I get to tell you how I got into cosmology and studies of dark matter. And the answer is I had this wonderful PhD advisor at Chicago University of Chicago, David Schramm. And yes, if there are students in the audience, find, find a great mentor. He was one of the founders of astroparticle physics, the idea that these small particles could explain the largest structures in the universe. So then um, the, I met this guy in Israel. He had worked on neutrino detection. And so I was a postdoc at Harvard after I finished at Chicago. And then the three of us, this is David Spurgle, um, wrote some of the very earliest papers on uh, the idea of, of wimp dark matter and how you would look for it. So we, um, yeah, we, we, we did some of these basic calculations and people, and then that got experimentalists excited and they started building detectors, which is pretty cool. And I just wanted to say they do have to be in underground laboratories, such as this is the xenon um, experiment on, in the Grand Sasso tunnel outside of Rome. The reason you have to do that is you have to shield from cosmic rays. So there's other particles flying around in the galaxy that do have electromagnetic interactions. And by the way, yes, they are dangerous for the human body. So when you, when you get on an airplane or for astronauts, it's a big deal to avoid you know, the, the, the getting hit by cosmic rays. But so if you wanna look for something that interacts weakly, you better go underground to get rid of the cosmic ray um, contamination. So at this point, it's, an, it's a worldwide search in these underground laboratories that are all over the place, uh, even the South Pole. 
And so I wanted to mention again, the Grand Sasso Tunnel, that's where I showed you the picture of one of the experiments, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about the one experiment that has seen something, that's the Dama Libra experiment. And what they've seen is an annual modulation that we predicted. So how does that work? Well, the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. So that makes it look like there's a wind of wimps coming at you. So, you know, when you're driving, the rain's going straight down, but it looks like it's coming at your windshield because you're driving into it. So that's the same idea here. It looks like there's a wimp wind simply because we're moving into the, into the, the wimps are moving in average directions and looks, we're moving into them. And on top of that, there is every, there's a modulation because the earth moves around the sun. And so what that means is that it leads to a change in the count rate depending on the time of year. So we predicted that you would have a peak in every June and a minimum every December. This is what we predicted, this curve. This is as, a different, as different years go went by in the DAMA data. You'd expect more counts in June. And guess what? That is what they have. This is not even all their data. So there's no doubt about it. They are seeing an annual modulation. They've got more than 10 years of data. So there's no doubt about it. But the question is, are they seeing WIMPs or are they seeing something else? And the, the, there's two issues. One is they won't release their data and that's not the way things are usually done. So people, other people can't look at it. So that's a very strange situation. And the second issue with, this, with these results is that other experiments see no signal, but it's bizarre, but, but you can't really, but it's like apples and oranges because these other experiments are made of different materials. So we don't know exactly how to compare the other experiments. So I do have to mention just for fun, the, the, the people who are the leaders of the experiments are also a lot of fun. And as Juan Colliar said, these are leaders of three of these experiments. I'm a Spaniard caught between two Italian women. So uh, yeah, let's plot on here the possible masses of these WIMPs. Like I said, this is one times the mass of the proton. This is 10,000 times as much. Well, I guess it only goes up to a thousand in this picture. And this is, how many events you get in the detector. Okay, so, well, this is weird. If Dama were right, you should be in these green regions, but these other experiments, xenon, and the, the made of xenon, these guys don't see anything. Oh, by the way, Dama is made of sodium iodide crystals. So sodium and iodine, these things are made of xenon. So you're supposed to be below the red and green curves, but, you're, but if Dama's right, you wanna be inside the green blobs. Well, that's not quite, it's, that's not quite true. The reason is that in order to plot everything on the same plot, I had to assume a very specific type of interaction for these particles. It's called spin independent. It's kind of the vanilla wimp. Yeah, well, the vanilla wimp does not explain these green things. It's ruled out, that's right. But we don't know the exact details of the interaction, especially if they're super, if they're super symmetric, there's other possibilities. And so it's, again, putting everything on this plot is it's like it's putting apple, trying to put apples and oranges on the same plot, it's difficult. Uh, so we, we have this wonderful meeting every other year, the UCLA Dark Matter meeting, and I sure hope we can do it again in person soon. So to test the DAMA result after 13 years of unexplained signal, finally, other groups are using the same material, the sodium iodide crystals. So these guys have working experiments. Well, cosine 100 has data, Anais has data, not enough yet. And Sabre is about to start taking data. So there's three exp other experiments with the same material. We're going to have an answer, although we don't yet. You know, I wanted to mention the, one of these xenon experiments also has an excess, an unexplained excess. So this is at a certain energy, there's more data than can be explained in terms of what we know. So hmm, maybe, so there's, maybe they're seeing dark matter. We don't know. In this case, probably not. The statistics aren't there to really argue that this is dark matter yet. But again, let's wait and see. This is an interesting case. Okay, I could go on and on, including new ideas that we have for dark matter detection using DNA. I think I'll just mention it briefly because it's so much fun. So believe it or not, you can buy this from the company called Illumina. You can buy a nanometer thin plane of gold. That means one atom thick with DNA attached. Yep, you can buy it for a few hundred bucks. And however, you know, it's not clean enough, radioactively clean enough to do dark matter experiments, but still the technology is there to do this kind of thing. So what happens is, well, you, you construct these DNA very carefully so you know exactly what they're made of. So what happens? A wimp comes along and hits the gold and then it knocks 
a gold nucleus forward into the DNA. So I'm not saying the WIMP, WIMP is not breaking your DNA, no, but the gold does break DNA. And because you've constructed these DNA very carefully, you can figure out what this track is. And this is nanometer accuracy for what this track is, which will then allows you to go and say, okay, I know where the WIMP came from. So the advantage is that if you know where the WIMP came from, you can look for that WIMP wind. So you point your detector in one direction or 180 degrees opposite, and you should get a different count rate. And then you go, aha, you see how proved it, it's really WIMPs. Paleo detectors, ancient rocks you can dig up and do other, another way to look for things. But I better move on to indirect detection, um, which is a third way to look for these things. And the idea here is to look for the products of this WIMP annihilation. And there's many way, many places you could do that. But the idea is that, well, as I mentioned, the dark matter is its own anti antimatter. So when two of them meet, they annihilate and they produce a chain of stuff. And at the end, there are things you can look for. You can look for neutrinos. You can look for high energy photons called gamma rays. And you can look for positrons, which are the antimatter of electrons. So there are experiments doing all three of these things. So um, for example, we have this guy looking for positrons, gamma rays, neutrinos, but the only one that's really particularly interesting is the Fermi satellite that's looking for high energy photons and they have an excess, okay? So this, it's, this is the gamma ray sky, it's kind of cool and you have these giant double bubbles and at the very center of our galaxy, there is an excess and the question is, is it from dark matter annihilation? Okay, so there are, so there are an excess in Dama and Xenon and Fermi. And so the question is, is any of that real? And the theorists are trying to explain it all as in a, a jointly. And so there's a lot, of, there's excitement. We don't know what's, whether there's already been detection or not. And so we're trying to figure out what's going on. I'm only going to do one slide on this or two, well, I mean, the, the basic idea, the fourth way to search for WIMPs, as I mentioned, dark stars. It's the same dark matter annihilation that happened in the early universe and that you're using for this indirect detection. It can also power stars. So um, this is an idea that I had with Doug Spoliar and Paolo Gondolo, and there was, we didn't know about this cult film that preceded our idea, but the basic idea is that the first stars formed when the universe is a few hundred million years old. And it's inside those first stars that you have a collapsing cloud of hydrogen right smack in the middle of proto galaxies where there's a lot of dark matter. And that dark matter annihilation can serve as a heat source for an actual star. It's normal equations of stellar structure, but that's a weird looking puffy star, 10 times as big as the radius between the earth and the sun. That's how big the radius is weird and they're very cool and they can, I have to point out, they're made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, dark matter constituting less than 0.1% of the mass of the star. But the thing that's interesting right now is that some of them can grow to be so large and bright, a billion times as bright as the sun, that the James Webb Space Telescope, which just launched, is just up there now, could in principle find them. So I'm really hoping that happens. And the other thing that's cool about them is once the dark matter runs out, then they would collapse to the black holes. And the, we don't know the origin of the supermassive black holes, such as the ones I talked about. And even really early in the universe, there are some. So it's exciting to speculate that these could be discovered in the near future and could be the explanation for supermassive black holes. So I talked about four directions for detection, the direct detection, indirect detection, collider searches, and looking for dark stars. So even stranger is dark energy, which is this big beast. So dark matter, we know it exists and we have idea, very concrete ideas how to look for it, but dark energy, we know so little about it. Okay, so dark energy is, you know what, and back on this picture, we do know that anything that's made of matter, the definition of matter is that it feels gravitational attraction. So uh, things are, masses pulled together. But dark energy has the opposite behavior. It's causing the universe to accelerate, okay? Not only are galaxies expanding apart from one another, but in the recent past, they started accelerating apart from one another. So dark energy has some kind of repulsive behavior, the opposite of what matter does. 
So it's, we're, we're really lost on this because we don't understand what causes this. So it may be some kind of vacuum energy. It may be that Einstein's equations need modification. But the, the only thing we really know about it is that it has this kind of repulsive behavior and we're trying to figure out what is going on. So I do want, I'm gonna end with this joke, which is at the World Science Festival in New York in 2011. The three of us over here were discussing dark matter on this panel. And these three guys were discussing dark energy. So I said, the one thing that we know to be true, dark matter is attractive while dark energy is repulsive. And I think I'll stop there. Here's my cosmic cocktail book, three parts dark matter. Take a look. It's meant to be written for a general audience. I think it's 10 bucks on Amazon. So it's, you know, pretty accessible. And here's my recipe. So as I said, black holes are not important. A million, if you have a, a 10 ounce drink, a millionth of an ounce supermassive black holes, 2.5 ounces dark matter. I rounded up to three, seven ounces dark energy. And here are some other ingredients. Be sure that in there, well, early on it was shaken. All those interactions going on, secret ingredient dark matter. So I think I'll stop there and let's turn to some questions. Thanks so much, Katie. That was a beautiful talk. So many exciting things. Um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, let's go ahead with questions. Perhaps we can take that question from early on about light being affected by gravity. Yes. Um, so I did show a picture that's called lensing. And yeah, I'm not gonna be able to explain that right now, but it is true, yes, that mass bends light and yes, it comes from Einstein's theory. So basically, I mean, if I throw a baseball, it's gonna follow a parabolic orbit and it turns out that the same thing happens with light. So, which is what's sport. You can think of this as was also responsible for this warping of space time. So, yeah, yes, it happens. And it was tested, it was tested. And I don't know, he wrote this, the equations down in 1915, but ten, less than 10 years later, it was already tested. They looked at the sun bending light from distant stars on some, there was some eclipse. And yes, the, the distant stars, you, they knew where they were and they saw the light being bent by the sun, the mass of the sun bent the light from distant stars observed almost immediately after the theory got written was written down. Excellent, excellent. Okay, there's a question. Uh, does dark matter affect decay now? For example, beta decay. Beta decay is part of the standard model of particle physics. So the answer is no, it doesn't. So beta decay is neutrons are a little bit heavier than protons. So if you leave a neutron sitting there, it decays in 10 minutes to a proton gives off an electron and, a, and a, a neutrino in the process. And that has nothing to do with dark matter. Um, and it's not affected by dark matter either. No, it's not. But dark, yeah, maybe you're asking about beta decay because that's an, a, another kind of weakly, weak, weakly interact. It's another weak interaction. The weak force is responsible for beta decay, but it's not affected by dark matter, no. Okay, there's a question. Um, in present understanding, is or was dark matter stable in time? That's, we think, yes. The, we're, what we're looking for is dark matter that lasts as long as the age of the universe. So yes, we're looking for something that doesn't decay in 14 billion years. It's possible that there was something else out there that, that, that lasted half of that time and then decayed to the dark matter we have today. So we could be, this could be what's, what's around now, could be the residual of something else that decayed. But basically we're looking for something stable. That's what dark matter has to be stable. Okay, very good. There's another question. Uh, why does dark matter cluster in filaments and is not homogeneously distributed? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good, very good question. So um, on the average, we treat the universe as being homogeneous. However, it's not on small scales. I mean, you exist. You're not, you're not part of a homogeneous universe. So there's something happened. And that's what I was talking about. You start out you, you, that in order to make galaxies and so on, there have to be inhomogeneities. They're tiny, tiny, tiny at the beginning. And we think they came from this early inflationary accelerated epoch of the universe, these tiny inhomogeneities where there were regions of the universe that had a little more 
uh, mass content than their neighbors. And then the, because they had more mass content, they had more gravitational traction, they pulled in ever more and so on and so forth. And that's this sort of, we call this gravitational instability picture of, of galaxy formation. And that the, the way the, that the matter clumps is, is, well, is very intimately tied to also what the photons are doing. So we test it in this cosmic microwave background light. Very good. So, so I, I've got a question um, about, about cooling, about dark matter cooling. Do we get enough cooling for dark matter for clustering without any interactions beyond the gravitational? Or, or is there some evidence that we need additional interactions to get the cooling right? Um, so I think what you're asking about is the reason, the reason that, that ordinary matter is in a disk is because it has all these interactions that allow it to cool off and, and settle down into the disk. Yeah. The dark matter is essentially collision-less from, from this perspective, and it's just gravity that makes it clump together to make galaxies. And that's, yes, that's enough. Okay, so, so right. So, so then, it, it, there, is there any evidence from astronomy, just from astronomy, um, that there are interactions beyond gravity for dark matter? Nope, no proof whatsoever there's anything beyond gravity. And that's the most horrible nightmares thought that for, yeah. somehow there's this other sector of the universe in, in, that is purely gravitational that we only, we, that we only if we only commute gravitation, communicate gravitationally with dark matter, then, how, then we'll never be able to see it if it's not, if it's some particle that doesn't have weak interactions or any other kind of interaction with our ordinary matter, then it's gonna be impo really impossible to figure out what it is. So let's hope that's not the case. Okay, yeah. Okay, there's another question. Uh, isn't it that mass bends light because it follows the curvature of space-time created by the mass? Yes, that is a good way to put it. I like that, thank you, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, are, are there any other questions? If, if not, let's thank Katie for a beautiful talk and a really lively discussion. I enjoyed it very much and I'm sure many people here did as well. So thank you very much. If you want to stick around and, 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 and talk with her privately, we'll, we'll stick around for a few minutes, but otherwise, thanks to everybody for coming. The next talk will be Lisa Randall on April 3rd. So see you then, bye. Thank you everybody for coming.